All right, hello, hello. Can everybody who is going to be in this session find a spot here in the front, if you would? Eventually, at your leisure. Um, again, for I, I think I've already seen most of you, but my name is Erin Workman. Um, it is my pleasure to be the Director of Industry Relations and Career Services here, as well as the co-chair for the songwriting department and the co-chair uh, with this amazing next guest that we have uh, for our new music business program that we'll be launching this fall. Um, Ron Sobel, I am going to let him brag about himself a bit, a lot, <laughs> and tell you somewhat of his story and uh, how he's gotten to where he is. I know I told you a little bit this morning. This is a man who um, has been in this business long enough to really see the trends change. He's been a part of some of the most pivotal um, cases as far as I'm going to, I don't want to give away too much, but I'm sure I'll talk about Napster a little bit, which is kind of an interesting piece. And uh, as a result, he's an you know, ASCAP's attorney for 16 years. Um, just some brilliant stories about some very big uh, band discoveries and signings that I think you guys will really enjoy. Um, and this is someone that we are so privileged and honored to have here at the campus who is a true leader and innovator and somebody who knows and can predict those trends of what's coming and helps to keep us as an industry informed of what we need to know. And to have uh, him here speaking to you, to new artists and new talent and making sure that you're really prepared for what's out there now and for what's coming. It really is invaluable, and I just can't say enough about him. He's a true friend, and um, I have great respect for him in, as a professional and just as a wonderful human being. So without further ado, I would like to bring up Ron Sobel. Hi, good morning, early morning to everybody. Aaron, thank you. Um, President Tom, Vice President Mike, staff, uh, thank you for this. The invitation is um, heartwarming and humbling to me. Um, I'm privileged to be able to talk to you guys and I have a few housekeeping details to clarify first. Um, I think the title of this was called Revenue in the Music Business or something. And in respect and deference to the people in the room, I'm going to play jazz for a moment, and I'm going to innovate and improvise, and I'm going to vamp a little bit off of revenue only. So with apologies to Mr. President and the staff, I'm much more interested in your careers. I'm much more interested, and let me back up. I'm going to sort of circle around for a while. We're here because primarily we're obsessed with music. We just hear it differently. Probably hear it differently than our parents. We probably hear it differently than our friends. It's a gift. And whether we're this one or this one or this one, this one, we just hear it differently. It's fabulous. It's just an obsession. I'm completely aware that many of you right now hear a melody in your ear that can't get out, you're not listening to me, I get it. You hear a drum beat, you're practicing, you're hearing a lyric that re repeats. They're called an earworm, I get it, I understand you're not listening to me. Every once in a while you'll tune in, but music is that emotional and connective to us. see that. Um, uh, this is today, in the next few minutes that we have, I'm much more interested in where we're going to go and where you guys are going to be. Your careers, and I don't care if it's a this, a vocalist, a this, 
the name of the game is to take our passion, to take our obsession and make a living from it. How do we support ourselves without having to do something that we don't want to do? Um, can people see that? Is that showing up? Yeah. Their boxes. Um, where's Aaron? Aaron, are you around here? Do you really want me to talk a little bit about my background? Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Um, a couple more housekeeping rules. Oh, good, thank you. A couple of more administrative police. Isn't that distracting when you hear music in another room? Isn't it amazing how distracting it is? Um, yes, it started with me in about the third grade. I was in art class, and the music room was two doors down. And I could not concentrate on art. I only heard what the piano teacher was doing. It was it just started at third grade. I'm sure it's probably the same for you guys. Um, music is what moves us. We hear it. We hear it differently. Let me fast forward to the fact that I always listen to music. Getting in my car at age 16 and having the radio on and music on in the car was incredible. And talk about distracted driving. It was way worse than texting and driving. But music was amazing. Um, in college, I was fortunate enough to pick up a guitar, and I played guitar for about four years in guitar in college. And it's, it's, I'm immodest to say that it, it, immediately and for four years, I was a very, very bad guitarist. Um, and it became apparent to me when I started to play with real people. Um, Rule number one, bad guitarists. And I'm using proper language here. I must say something else. Real quickly, this is going to turn into be my office. You guys are going to sit there. It's going to be in my office. And if I use bad words, because sometimes there are knuckleheads in the industry and people that don't appreciate our art, and I have a tendency to be sort of cursory towards bad people, if I use a bad word or a bad gesture, please try and, I'll, I'll, I'm going to try and behave, I promised everybody. Um, it, it became apparent to me that I heard music. I knew I was going to be in a band. It was destined that I was going to be in a band from college, and it was clear that I was awful. Um, I could hear it. I couldn't play it. And rule number one, awful guitar players wind up in law school. It's just where we go. It's, what, it's how we have to get next to our gifted friends. Um, law school. Uh, law school was fascinating to me and all I did was hang with my music friends and my music friends I am in awe of creators um, our world revolves around two pies I like to draw pictures you'll see these things uh, there are composers that write music songwriters lyricists music melody and there is the recording of that song record companies, indie labels, something called. But I'm going to continually refer to those that own the composition and create it and a completely different world of the people that own the recording. And I believe a few of us collaborated several years ago, wrote a song called Yesterday, and we're the composer of a song called Yesterday, and we're the songwriter. Isn't that amazing? 400 people can own a recording of Yesterday but the composers get paid every time it's played. The composers get every t paid every time it's sold. So just understand every time I'm going to talk about music and revenues and opportunities for us in our career, there's a composer and a publisher, that's you, you combined, and there's going to be a recording. And I'm going to talk about these two streams of income for us. Um, oh, you want to hear a little bit about me? I really hate doing this part. Okay. Um, after I graduated law school, I lived with musicians for a long time. I represented musicians. It was all I could do is be next to my music makers. It didn't really matter what I did. And that'll be a key phrase because I literally swept floors in recording studios as an attorney to be next to music. I did not want to not be in music. So I didn't care what I did. It didn't matter. I already wasn't this guy. I just wanted to be next to it. Um, and quite frankly, doing this and teaching is as rewarding to me now. And that's why we have fabulous teachers here at the school. Um, 
I got hired as an attorney, I fast forward, I got hired as an attorney at ASCAP in the early 1800s. Um, and my job was as a director of business affairs, but also director of creative affairs, was to attract and sign people to ASCAP. There was BMI and CSAC, you all have to join one of them if you want to get paid writer royalties. I was working at ASCAP in creative and business affairs. Someone in an office down the hall played a CD for me, and the voice spoke to me. The voice spoke to me. We're in 1988. Sorry, it's just how old we are. Uh, the voice was astounding. I stopped, I went in, and I went, so what is that? And they said, it's an indie band on an indie label called Sub Pop. It's a band called Soundgarden, and that voice on that indie record is called a boy called Chris Cornell. Now, I don't know how back in time people know if Soundgarden is dating me or not, if it's important, but that voice called me. And Chris Cornell's voice was just incredible. I went to my then boss at ASCAP and said, I heard that voice, Sub Pop's in Seattle, I need to go to Seattle. I need to see this guy. He needs to be with ASCAP. I'm going officially to sign him to ASCAP. I just needed to see the band and I needed to see the voice. Anyway, of course, my boss at the time said, Seattle, there's only music in Nashville and New York and Los Angeles. There's nothing in Seattle. And I said, I need to go. I fought him. He allowed me to go. I went to see Soundgarden open, I believe, for a band called Pantera. And it's a little foggy for me. Is that a band? I'm not even so sure. Soundgarden opened. Um, if Chris Cornell means anything to you guys, cut off shorts, Doc Martin boots, long hair, shirt off, pacing across the stage, being incredible. And as he did for most of his career, at the end of his pacing back and forth, would literally beat the crap out of the bass player. And I never really understood it, but he would pace and continually bump into the bass player and ultimately just jump on top of him. And the last song was Chris Cornell beating the crap out of the bass player. Um, Kim Thayall, guitarist, playing along all the time. is wonderful. Anyway, I talked to the manager of Soundgarden that night after the show. I went outside. The manager of Soundgarden was, of course, selling T-shirts in the lobby. That's what managers do in, in the time. And I said, wow, that's fabulous. Can I meet with the band? I want to talk to them about ASCAP. And he said, they're great. We'll meet tomorrow morning. So Saturday morning, I had a date to meet Soundgarden and talk to them about publishing. And well, that's fine. That guy, this is a quick story, I'll make it short. God, this is awful for me. So that t-shirt salesman slash manager said, if you like Soundgarden, go see my other band playing tonight in the rehearsal hell. It's a three-story thing across the tracks in Seattle. Three stories of what you guys probably live in, these awful practice rehearsal halls. Loud noise, every room loud noise. He said, go see room 201 and you gotta see my band. And at 11.30 or 12 that night, I went to see his band in room 201. Not good, not impressive, it didn't mean anything to me. I didn't get it, didn't hear it. Um, but there was so much noise coming from the room. But what did happen is I got up to the third floor, and on the third floor, out of all these loud, trashy, terrible bands playing and practicing, there was a singer outside of his rehearsal hall, and his guys were behind closed doors making loud music, and this singer was out in the hallway pacing back and forth, singing to what was on the other side of the door. That singer was mesmerizing, just absolutely astounding, quite frankly possessed, and more importantly, probably demonic, but nonetheless, I couldn't take my eyes off of this guy. It's about two in the morning, and I watched this guy, and about, 30 minutes into this at 2.30 in the morning, I went to him and I said, Yo, what's up, dude? What's going on? And he said, I'm just practicing. My, I said, can I come inside and can I see you guys? We talked. To make a long story short, I said, what's the name of your band? He said, the, the band is called Diamond Lie. Has anybody heard of Diamond Lie? Of course not. I talked to Diamond Lie and I said, what's your name? And he said, my name is Lane Staley and that's Jerry Cantrell and we're Diamond Lie. And I said, could I have your cassette? I want to do something with you. And he said, well, we're thinking of changing our name to Alice in Chains. 
And I said, well, that's fine. I, that sounds sort of equally demonic to me. But anyway, I took the Alice in Chains. He, he mailed me a cassette that didn't say Diamond Lie. It said Alice in Chains. And we were happy to take it to Columbia Records. They were phenomenal. Um, Alice in Chains, does that mean anything to anybody? I can't tell how archaic this is being. Is that, are we in dinosaur land or not? Anyway, um, they were phenomenal. It was incredible. Is that a combination of just luck being at the right time? I think having some ears, I pride myself on my ears, I pride myself on being a terrible guitarist, but nonetheless, I did hear it. We were able to help that. Things like that happen. If bands, artists, are magnetic, magnetic, people will come to you. If you are attractive, not attractive in a face, if you are attractive because people are compelled and drawn to your music, that wins, that's what people want. I got, I got myself into an, just a shitload of, sorry, a real lot of trouble, forgive me, I knew that was gonna happen. Um, I got myself into a terrible amount of trouble because I went to one of these big famous um, songwriter expos a, about a year ago and the panel before me was called Marketing and Sales. And the four people up there were all marketing guys and the key word that came out of that was, you gotta market, you gotta sell, you gotta market, you gotta sell. And I was so offended, it was just so offensive to me that I had to get on on the panel afterwards, which was about music licensing and film and TV, and we'll get to that. Um, but I had to get up there and say, you know, forgive me, marketing sales might mean something, but if music is attractive, people will find out about it. More and more so in the environment that you guys live in. Um, virality. That's a word, and we're going to make up a lot of words. People will find it. People will find it. I'm going to tell you some ways that we'll, people will find it quicker and faster. But I just think if it's authentic, if it's compelling. I've written a book. Did I bring a copy of my book? I wrote a book about music publishing. There's a chapter called On a Scale from 1 to 10. And quite frankly, and let me be honest with you, um, songwriting, the gift, the art, the talent, the skill of songwriting, on a scale from 1 to 10, it's got to be a 10. Um, most of the tapes that I received in 40 years um, have been a 2. And I always receive a 2 and I say, good work, emerging writer, that's really great. Let me hear your next work. And the next one hopefully is a 4 or a 6. And I say, great work, songwriter, let me hear your next tape. And hopefully a 6 becomes an 8. But ultimately what we need to understand is, do I want to t spend time on my career with an eight. More importantly, does the world need another eight? And we just set a bar now for ourselves. And for me, I make a sports analogy. I don't know if it works for you. Try and figure something that works for you. For me, it was Kobe Bryant, this obsessive, maniacal, astounding, committed guy before he got injured. Um, Venus Williams, Serena Williams, Michael Phelps, pick someone that you can relate to that you see obsession in their eyes, you see diligence of what they do, and that's what we're looking for in songwriters. We're looking for that in producers. We're looking for that in any kind of production, performance, vocalist, and if it's magnetic and, and authentic, if the lyric is compelling and fresh, people will want to be attracted to you. If you have to push it down people's throats, if you have to market it and sell it, something's not right. You want to be attracted. And I trust the people that are here at 9 a.m. at this hour are probably pretty committed to their careers. Let me finish real quickly. I've got other things to talk about, but I'll get you later. When I talked to Lane Staley and Jerry Cantrell at Alice in Chains that night and said I was amazed by you guys and you're incredible, they said to me, and this is how it works, and they said to me, wow, if you like us, and I'll meet with you, I'm gonna meet with, I'm gonna meet with Soundgarden. Tomorrow morning I'm now talking to Diamond Lie, which is really Alice in Chains. Sort of it was a pretty astounding Friday night. Lane Staley said, if you like what we do, You've got to go see my other band playing Saturday night, not my, but a, our friend's band playing Saturday night. And they're playing at an underage roller skating rink, and you must see them. And I said, Lane, I'm Ron. I don't go to underage roller skating. <laughs> don't do it. And he said, you must go see them. They're great. And I said, what's the name of that band? 
And he said, the name of the band is Mother Love Bone. Has anybody heard of a band called Mother Love Bone? Whoa, yikes. Bonus points. Mother Love Bone. Okay, Mother Love Bone on a Saturday night that I've just seen Soundgarden. I've just seen what would become Alice in Chains. And he wants me to see Mother Love Bone Saturday night at an underage roller skating ring. I went. And they were incredible. Mother Love Bone was incredible. Uh, there were two guitarists that were amazing. Their songwriting was amazing. Everything was amazing. The lead singer was this eccentric, feather boa, over-the-top kind of lead singer that was sort of compelling as his own right, but the band was behind him. And I sat and talked to Mother Love Bone. They got signed to A&M Records by Michael Goldstone. We're in about 1980, well, it's 88 or 89. About four weeks before the release of the Mother Love Bone album on A&M Records, Andy Wood, the lead singer of Mother Love Bone, the eccentric feather boa guy, Andy Wood, regrettably passed away. He died. You have a record that's been recorded by an amazing band, and a month before release, the lead singer died. Uh, we in A&M had no idea what to really do. Right? a and I think it was a and I'm getting Soundgarden confused. Anyway, Mother Love Bone lost Andy Wood. But the band was incredible. The songwriter, Jeff Ament, if anybody, Stone Gossard, if anybody knows these guys in Seattle. Uh, I belabor the point. Anyway, we searched, we looked, we found a replacement for Andy Wood, and that guy's name was Eddie Vedder, and we decided to call that band Pearl Jam. So in a Friday night, I saw Soundgarden, was able to meet with them. I saw Alice in Chains at 3 in the morning, and then Saturday night saw what turned out to be Pearl Jam. It happens like that. I was able to have industry contacts. I can't say that I did anything unilaterally. It took a team, and team will show up later in this conversation. Um, there were other little people, big people, that I was helpful with, but once you have that position, I sit in a chair at ASCAP, I heard tapes. A friend called me and said, I've got a little guitar player, would you like to listen to his cassette tape? My God, it could have been an 8-track, but it was a cassette tape. It was in the 90s, the early 90s. And I popped it on and I tried to listen to this tape of this young, unknown kid called Lenny Kravitz. And I had to call the manager back and say, something's here, this is good. Lenny Kravitz. Um, those are the things that happen and that's what has to happen in this room. That's what has to happen in this school. Um, I've been fortunate to deal with those. If we hear it, if it's magnetic, we're attracted to it, somebody's going to hear it. Somebody much more powerful and connected than me, someone's going to tell something. 1989, when we did this, 89, there was no viral, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, there was no way to get the word out. We lived in a box. Man in a box. Alice in Chains. We lived in a box that literally major label had to get signed. It was the only option that I had, certainly when I was growing up in the 70s or earlier. Major label, you had to get airplay and then you got to get sales. And I lived in that box, man in the box. We go forward to where you guys are at and I'm mostly interested in what's going to happen to you guys when you come out in two years when you come out in four years. So what I'm gonna to try to do today, do we have a few minutes left? I really hated talking about myself. Um, this is about your career. And I'm gonna try and share with you some ideas. The happiest part of my career is that A, I was obsessed with music. B, I needed to be next to people, and C, I didn't work in a record company. Thank goodness. Um, now let me preface the rest of my comments by one more housekeeping rule. There are some of us in this room, staff, administration, instructors, some of us are very smart. There's some really, really smart people here. Accomplished people. The really smart people in the room are you guys in these chairs 
trying to listen to this is you guys that are starting starting your careers and about to take off and emerge it's you guys that have grown up and lived in a world of devices devices that you google and i didn't have the word google we didn't have the word facebook we didn't have the word twitter we didn't have that so i lived in a world called sales let me be clear there is a rumor out there that the music industry is on the titanic and that we're aimed for the iceberg and there's a rumor out there that the music industry is dying and dead and what the heck are you idiots doing in the music business and the truth of the matter is that the iceberg is a very very teeny thing sitting in the ocean that's surrounded about 99 percent of unlimited opportunity unlimited opportunity there could not be a better time to be in the music business there could not be a better time to be a musician i was born and raised in a box i could if i if my band did not get signed to a major label 20 years ago 30 years ago my career was over if, and how would i ever get to the major label and that was the attention we now have a range of different opportunities. Um, let me sort of lay this out. I'm sorry to be historical. If I was, if I had time, that's a critical date for you. If I had a lot of time, we can do this tomorrow morning. We really want to talk about that date. When I see you guys Tuesday morning, because this is going to continue, we want to talk about that date. Probably the most important date in your futures. So I'm going to go this way with you and try and talk about why that was critical to you. I had to have sales. In the late 80s, maybe early 90s, something happened and watch this progression and stick with me. Do I still have a few more minutes? Okay. In the 80s or 90s, there was a television show that some of you may have heard of in the history books called Miami Vice. Has anybody heard of an old TV show? And there might be a new one, but there's an old one, Crockett, Tubbs, Miami, Cops and Robbers. Michael Mann was the producer. At that time, most, most of television, pop television, had music score by composers, some of the brilliant people in here that compose for background TV. Most of television had music score in it. You would hire a composer, that would be the, that's the thing. For some shocking reason that I need to instill in you guys, we just have to break down barriers and allow you guys to do this. For some reason, Michael Mann saw a scene in Miami Vice between Crockett and Tubbs, and somehow he heard the lyrics of a song, the visceral emotion of a song that captured the scene better than his composer could capture the scene. And Michael Mann shockingly went to a band and said, may I license your song for my show? Virtually unheard of. The band back then was a band called Genesis, Phil Collins, does that mean anything to anybody? The song was called Something in the Air. If you go back to Miami Vice, what compelled Michael Mann to break down every rule that we would have grown up in in music and go outside of composer world and license a song. He licensed something in the air tonight. License means he went to the composer, he went to the record company. Two different entities, two different things, and wanted to license the work. It's not a buyout, it's not a theft, it's not a steal, it's not a transfer, it's I want to license and use this. I'm gonna pay you a bag of money and I'm gonna pay you a bag of money these are usually the same and equal. And it's called a licensing fee, a sync license, to put the music into a TV show. It was sort of earth shattering. It hadn't happened before, but it opened the door to this. Holy smokes, I have a new way to make money. I'm not living in this prison cell any longer of having to get signed to a major label. If my indie record and people were starting to go to make records and trying to shop them. 
rarely getting signed, but they're still viable records. But now we have an opportunity that we've made an indie record, made a recording, or have a label, indie label help us. And in addition to trying to get major label airplay, oh my goodness, um, if there's a, a, a way to make our careers more fruitful, in comes licensing. Hi, Phil Collins. We would like to license your song for 10 grand. Five grand, five grand. 10 grand, it doesn't matter. Name a price, negotiate a deal, licensing. Well, that in the 90s, whenever that happened, opened this unlimited door to licensing opportunities. I love page 32 and 33 in the brochure about the school about what are your dream jobs? Um, that probably had 75. I think by the time I'm done, I'm going to have about 352 today as we get down here. Dream jobs are unlimited. But licensing now, think of where songs, tracks, indie bands now are licensed. And it's unlimited. It's going to be driven by you being Michael Mann and breaking down a barrier and putting music in some place where it hadn't been used before. Uh, poof video games, poof, talking picture frames. It doesn't matter, it's unlimited or it's stuffed animals. Uh, there is an aggressive amount of licensing now, in addition to TV, in addition to film now is finally using music. So we've opened this door to licensing. All right, that's in door number one. Music supervisors are important, filtering, listening, understanding where music can be licensed. Um, in my law firm, I, I, I was at ASCAP for 16 years. In the last 15 years, I've had my own law firm. My law firm practices law, represents artists, producers, studios, but we also have a division of artist development and pitching songs to film and TV. It's a great career, pitching songs, trying to get the attention of music supervisors and Grey's Anatomy and Walking Dead People and Breaking Bad. How do you want songs? And we've been fortunate that we placed over 300 songs of indie artists, unknown artists. Ironically, my three biggest artists that I own the publishing on, Bruce Hornsby, Bonnie Raitt, Cher. Oh boy. Um, we never got a placement for any of those. 300 placements of only indie unknown bands. And we've been happy with it. The bands have been happy. We license a lot of money. Um, Let me start, or let me do this. What I'd like to happen in the next few minutes, if I do this right, is I need you guys to jump in and vocalize, because I'm about to ask you questions. The three C's up here is what I did want to do is have a conversation about earning cash. I did want to outline all the different careers we're going to do. But most importantly today, this is about critical thinking solutions. We have an industry that's evolving. And if the knuckleheads want to say the industry is collapsing, good for them. The industry can collapse for them. We're going to employ critical thinking, solutionism, and find answers to questions. Let me do one small example of how we can make money and how you can think about making money. We represented a band. This is an absolute true story. It was in my office. It happened a few years ago. We represented an indie band from the middle of nowhere. Uh, Nebraska, perhaps. Lovely state. They put out an indie rock CD. It was fabulous. It was really amazing. They asked us if we would license their music. We licensed it. We got a fair amount of a lot of placements. Grey's Anatomy, 90210, Beverly Hills. I, I, $2,000, $1,500, $3,000, $2,000, a lot of licenses. This one production studio through a network loved the band, licensed about four or five of their tracks, called me and reminiscent of the Michael Mann, Phil Collins episode, the production company for this one TV show said, we like this track. Track six, it's amazing. It speaks to the footage. It speaks to the scene. We want to license. Ron, let's not screw around three grand, four grand, seven grand. Woo, seven grand? How many people here would take seven grand for license? It's a pretty cool thing. We're not giving anything away. We're licensing it. 
3500 for you guys who own your own indie record, 3500 for you guys, the composers who wrote it. Okay, seven grand. For the first time in my life, and let's talk about mistakes, because we should talk about big bad mistakes, Ron really screwed up, because Ron was friends with the production company, and Ron said something like, can you pay us more than seven grand? That's sort of ridiculous. Um, I don't like playing those kind of pig games, but I did. They came back and said, well, we'll pay eight. We love the track. The track has to be in. We love it. It was great. To which Ron said, would you pay us 10? And they said, sure, 10. Okay, Ooh, Ron, you're sort of a jerk, but we'll pay you 10. Um, Shockingly, Ron said, will you pay us 12? Now, we're talking about an indie band from Nebraska that gets $3,000 licenses. They've had a handful of them. Why Ron would say 12, I knew the guys. It was okay. I wasn't going to get shot, but I went to 12. The production company said, hold on. Ooh, we'll think about that. They actually said we would pay you 12. I actually said, could you pay us more than 12 is what the true story is. And they said, we'll call you back the next day. They called us back the next day and said, you know, Ron, we need the track. We love the track. We love the band. We sort of used to like you. You're starting to turn into be sort of a jerk, but um, we love the band. How about this? The $12,000 offer is off the table. We, we revoke it. That's not there. Instead of the $12,000 offer, we want to use the track. We will give you a visual credit at the end of the episode, 24 million viewers. We'll give you a visual credit, www, band from Nebraska, blue skies, have a good day, www. And for eight seconds, your scrolling title will be the band and the title at the end of the show. You don't get $12,000, we'll give you the card. Okay, poof, you're the band. Okay, help me guys, we're in a band, we're in the band. There's five people in our band in the real room, now we're in bed. How many of us in our band want to take the 12 grand? Wait, how many? They need to see you on the camera. Okay, how many people want to take the visual credit card? Okay, true story, a fight broke out in my office. A physical fight broke out because half of the band needed to earn their wage. Half of the band had support other kinds of family support, other support, um, whatever they're doing on the side. But they couldn't resolve it. They couldn't resolve it. It was a really ugly fist fight, 12 grand credit card. We fought about it. I called the studio the next day with a non-answer. I didn't know where that was going to go. You guys are somewhat divided, almost 50-50 on this. And I went to the studio the next day and said, Hi, I'm here to talk about my $14,000 placement. And they said, The credit card offer that we gave you yesterday is revoked. You guys are stuck with the $12,000. A different band accepted the credit card first. That's the only credit that we put on. You guys are stuck taking $12,000. Um, there's not a right or wrong answer in this. This is phase one of critical thinking. This is how bands have to operate and work. Um, let me give you a small insight. If you have a manager, if you have an attorney that you owe $1,500 to, if you have a manager that you owe 15% to, if you have a licensing guy that you have to pay some sort of negotiated commission to the licensing guy, and you pick a free credit card, what's in it for your attorney and your manager and your licensing guy? And how do you make that decision? Critical thinking, these are solutions, what helps the band? Um, let me go to rule number one, cliche number one. This will be on the final. Rule number one, before people pay for your CD, before people pay to see you at the tour, before people pay royalties, before people pay for your merch, before people pay you any amount of money for your band, they have to pay attention. They have to pay attention. If they don't know about you, they can't be attracted to you. 
They can't be magnetic. So a job one for us becomes exposure. Growing up, when I was a young guy in a band, really bad band, but when we were growing up, the marketing department, the promotion department, all that kind of stuff was sort of important. I sort of hated it. I did not get marketing. I did not get promotion. Look at me. I know an E chord and an A chord. That's really important to me. Watch me do my down, up, up, up. Um, I didn't like marketing. It wasn't music to me. Music lives. But we now have to marry music, the beauty, the gift of music, with business. We have to start making decisions on how we support ourselves. Um, the licensing decision for 12 grand is a good example on, do you want the exposure or do you have to live off of the cash? Let me give you a small solution. I'm gonna give you a, a, a peek into critical thinking. What's in it for me if that band takes the credit card? I, I want them to take 12 grand because I'm about to take my commission. If we had more time, I would ask you guys how much you would pay me to be your licensing agent. I guarantee the fist fight would start to break out. There will be blood when we talk about what you guys want to pay me to be your licensing agent. We don't have enough time. Do we have time? Or how are we doing? We have five minutes left? Five minutes left? Oh my God. All right. I wanted This is terrible. Um, I need to address a few things. Is there going to be questions? I really did not know that we only had five minutes left. Um, the internet happened. Two things happened. That says digital. That says access. You guys have to now think of this really important dilemma. Are people going to embrace our products by owning it and have a physical copy and download? Do they have to own it physically or are they going to stream it and access it? How many people here have MP, M, M pods? My, MP3 players, iPods, with a lots of stuff on that. How many people listen to Pandora and Spotify and Deezer and Tidal as of a couple minutes ago? Um, you get to this notion of they're not mutually exclusive, but are we going to gear our band, are we going to gear our art for a digital download or for people to access? Which is more important? Then you get into this notion as we're split. We're now sort of bipolar because there is a fan analysis and there is a band analysis. As a fan, do you like to stream more or do you like to download more? When you're in an airplane, would you like to be able to listen to songs that are downloaded because some of the streaming on airplane is not accessible. When you're climbing in the Himalayas, streaming might not be possible. If you have downloads, you're always possible. Download, 99 cents after everyone takes it, turns out to be 50 cents. A stream is point oh 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 one cents per stream. As fans, do we want to stream our music and enjoy it? We can go to Spotify and pick whatever song we want. Pandora is more open. As a artist, do we want 50 cents for a download or do we want point oh 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 one cents per stream? Well, I suspect 50 cents looks like a bigger number to me than that. I suspect if you asked the Beatles in 1964, would they want their fans to download that thing once? Or would they like their fans for 50 years to continue to listen to their music? Not mutually exclusive, but we have to be really mindful of what's going on. Let me turn the tables as a fan. We're now artists. Let me turn the table from artists. How many here? I'm. Tim Cook, I own Apple, I'm looking for people to work at iTunes, I can pay 75 grand a year, who wants to come work for me at iTunes? 75 grand a year to start, does anybody want to work? iTunes? Oh, 75 grand, a few people, okay, whew, I'm the CEO of Spotify. I'd like people to come work for me at Spotify for 75 grand a year. How many people would like to come work for me at Spotify for 75 grand a year? Okay, as a musician, then you so there's there's choices as a fan, there's choices as an operative, there's choices as a consumer, there's choices as a creator, which is more important. Well, it gets complicated, and you have to make an analysis. It's not exclusive, and then you get to this next dilemma about 
live versus streaming. Boy, are we really almost out of time? Really? I'll do this really quickly. Live versus streaming. I work for a streaming company. I, one of my clients is a streaming company. He went to Coachella, Lollapalooza, went to a lot of the festivals and said, we want to stream your festival. Okay, you're the band, you're playing at Lollapalooza. You are Adele, Kings of Leon. See ya. Imagine Dragons, Rolling Stones. Okay, you're playing Lollapalooza. I come to, Lollapalooza paying you a couple hundred thousand dollars to perform on stage. Me and my internet streaming company comes to you and says, we want to stream you globally. How many people, and I'll pay you some amount of money. We'll talk about a new bag of money to stream you. How many people want to be streamed globally to Morocco and Spain and Asia while you're playing Lollapalooza? How many people do not want to be streamed when they're on stage? Okay, that's pretty clear. The answer is you don't want to be streamed. Okay. The answer is we made these offers to a, to a large festival that we wanted to stream them. And the answer was 50% of the bands said, lovely, that's great, we love it. 50% of the bands said, no thank you, we don't want to be streamed. Um, they didn't say it quite that politely. 50% of the bands saw being streamed was not only an additional paycheck, they saw it as global promotion. They saw it as a great way to get attention. 50% of the bands thought it would cannibalize the rest of their tour. They did not want people to see them. You get to make a decision, critical thinking. This is where you guys are facing this in terms of streaming. Let me ask one more example. I'm sorry, this has gone on way too long. I have way too many questions. I'll wrap it on this. Name a famous band that we would like to see. It's not gonna be Lil Wayne. It's not gonna be, God forbid. Anyway, so there's a great band that we, is, is Sia a band? Hozier, Hoosier, okay. Okay, we wanna see a great band. Adele, U2, Coldplay at Staples Center. And we have an option of you two people buying tickets and each paying $125 to go and drive down to Staples and see the show and pay for parking and buy a $4 Coke and sit in probably row 120 and watch Adele in seat 120 and be in the moment probably watching most of the show on the widescreen CD on um, TVs on the side of the set. My streaming company is going to stream that same concert, except we're going to have six cameras. It's going to aim one at the face, one at the guitar, one at the keyboards, one at the thing. My six cameras will have all these different angles. My six cameras will have backstage interviews, and we're going to talk to Kings of Adele backstage. We're going to have all these interviews and interactive interviews. You get to stay home at your home, on your couch, put it up on your widescreen, surround sound, watch the concert any way you want, plus you have hands-on interviews. As a fan, how many people want to drive to Staples Center and pay the money? As a fan, how many people want to sit on their couch and have the access of this? Okay. As a band, do you say yes to the streaming company to allow you to be streamed? The answer is you have options. The answer is you can geofence these things. You can say it can't be seen within 100 miles. You can't. But you're going to get to this notion of about, I'm saying that you have to pay attention. You get to this question, is attention cannibalizing other tours, other dates? Is it promoting other tours, other fistfights? Bands fight over this. It, agencies fight over this. I, so we've gotten into an enormous fight with CAA and William Morris over would we want their band, does it hurt their tour income? Let me close. Is it closing time? Did this really go? I use this way up. Let me close by this. This is a fascinating moment. I'm just so thrilled at what you guys can do. There is a bunch more C words. Probably the most important one is CX. That'll be on the final. It's about the consumer experience. Everything that we're going to talk about of you moving forward is now going to be geared to the consumer. The consumer can do it on the device. The consumer can put it on a big device. The consumer can shazam your song. We have to be mindful of our great art. All we're really worried about is singing.
We're really worried about getting on tape. We want the producer to get it right, the drum sound. Look at the cymbals. How much time are we going to spend on getting those cymbal sounds right? Music is fabulous. How are we promoting it? And I think the key words for us is just a now barrage of more C letters. I think we have to collaborate. I think we have to curate. I think we have to cultivate. Probably the most important word for me today is probably teamwork and that you who are the artful need to associate s with somebody who knows social media. I think someone who understands how to penetrate digital opportunities, who knows how to talk to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and get the word out. If your music is magnetic and you have a team member that knows how to expose it, I think you have a tremendous opportunity for success. There are unlimited careers. It may not be that you wind up as the vocalist and the guitarist, but you'll be next to people. You might even be a teacher, which we love. Um, but I just have to end on saying it could not be a better time for you. I am so thrilled. I am so impressed by what the college is trying to offer to you, the mentality of the college. It starts from the administration down. There are some fabulous people here, and the opportunities couldn't be better. I wish you all great success. Have a great day. Thank you very much. All right, one more time. Wasn't he incredible? Yeah. Really great. Thank you, Ron. <laughs>